don't know what you guys use for uh, Bible software, but uh, there is a, what I use is a, a product called eSword. It works on PC or Mac, and you can download the apocryphal books for free. Um, I don't know if all Bible apps give you that ability, uh, but e-sword.net uh, or eSword in your, I think it's eSword in your app store. Um, they give you the apocrypha for free and you can enable it or not enable it um, for reference. All right, any questions so far? Okay, I do have a question. Go ahead. Um, not in regards to this, but kind of. So my cousin sent me this book that I should get, and it's the Encyclopedia of the Lost and Rejected Scriptures. And it says Pseudophigrapha in Apocrypha. Is that, is that a good book or no? I've never heard of it. Okay. Um, I'm not I'm probably not saying this correctly, but I don't know if you can see it. Oh, no, I'll just text it to you. Okay. So yeah, I'm just trying to see... Um, is that something to use along with the study? So um, so as I mentioned before, the canon is, is the whole of scripture, but there, you're going to come across words in the Bible that you don't know what they mean, right? And then what you're going to do is you're going to use some source to define that word. And so using reference books, there's nothing wrong with using reference books alongside of the Bible to gain clarity about what you're reading, right? So if you need to define a word, you go to a dictionary. You want to learn more about a place in time, you go to an encyclopedia, right? Uh, if you want to learn more about, uh, about words that are written in the scripture and their original languages, then you would use an interlinear right? That's going to have both the Greek and Hebrew there for you to reference along with English. So using reference material, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, where reference material can get, can get any of us in trouble is when we exalt it above the scripture. So that's my disclaimer for reference material, but to that end, use as much of it as you can. The information is out there. The problem is, is that it takes hard work to go find it. And it's, but it's there. So if you, if this book has information that gives you insight um, and they can prove what they are saying in the book, then by all means use it because it's a source, right? Thank you. Right. You're welcome. Pass, I thought, do you have anything to say to add to that? Yeah. Um, I, a little bit. So I think, so there's lots of writings out there, y'all, that are really um, not sound, right? So I'm just saying there's lots of, there's lots of information out there that is um, high degree of speculation, yeah. high degree of speculation, um, high, a high degree of emotion, Right and speculation and, and pain. So when you read it, you read pain, you read anger, you read speculation, you read emotion, and it's very light on fact. What, what Lewis is, 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 has, and has packaged for us in his packaging, and I appreciate what he did earlier. He said, I can't prove, I can't prove, um, the uh, good grief, what mountain was that? Uh, Ararat. Ararat. So I can't prove Ararat. So we're going to move on. We're just going to, because we got enough with or without Ararat. We've got enough to, to, to um, argue a firm and a solid case that with indisputable fact, with or without Ararat. Okay. Uh, so what we want to remove is speculation. There's a lot of angry authors out there. And so, Tanika, all that I would say is, um, you know, as you read th this stuff, um, ask, ask the Lord, as I do. I read a lot of stuff. I, I ask the Lord to kind of uh, create a barrier between my head and my heart. If that makes any sense, right? 
So I read a lot of stuff, just intellectual information. And I just, I'm just, I'm reading and I'm saying, hmm, that's interesting. Hmm, that's interesting. It's when it starts penetrating your heart that it becomes, that it becomes dangerous. And I like what Lewis said, that, that the Apocrypha, I mean, there are books, the, the Apocrypha, are, it's good historical information, right? It helps us to understand the, uh, what happened in that time, right? However, there's some, there's a lot of weird stuff and you know, unusual stuff that takes place in the Apocrypha too, that some of it seems to contradict the canonized Bible. And so what Lewis is saying is this, the Bible is our, you see that I'm one of the few people that have a 1611. I have a 1611. Okay. Um, you know, and I sent Lewis some images out of it, as a matter of fact, just a few moments ago. But but I, I know, but at the same time, this is my this is my authority right, right here. And so I'm, I'm, I want you guys to keep this, this Bible as your authority and everything else is just historic. I'm, I want you to read all that other information like you're reading history, poetry, you're understanding, hey, what's going on? OK, now I get it right. But however, there's some, there's some stuff in the Apocrypha that also points to um, a displaced people being shipped over to uh, different parts of the world and so on and so forth. So um, it's good stuff. I hope I hope. Does that make any sense what I'm saying, y'all? It does. Yes, it does. Yeah. OK, so your friend, your cousin is sending you a lot of books and I've had people send me a lot of books. But a lot of it is just is angry. I, OK, angry people books hurt people books, okay, emotional people books, and it's light on fact, okay, and, and, and it's, it's, and so what we don't want to do is get into speculation, and so as you read it, go ahead and read it, but as you read it, read it through the lenses of, is this speculation, or is this fact, and, and it, you know what I mean, because he should be able to, be, you know, whoever wrote it should be able to build a robust argument for what, whatever they're saying. Okay, Lewis. Thank okay. you, man. Oh, no worries. Thank you for adding that. So, I have a question. So what is, so is the 1611 that the pastor, the book you held up, is that the Apocrypha? No, that was, it's interesting about the, about the 1611. The 1611 was one more English version of the Bible. The previous English version was Tyndale's version. Um, and so the 1611 just happens to be the version of the Bible that includes the Apocrypha between the text. So between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the Apocrypha, okay? Jubilees, uh, not Jubilees, but the Maccabees and, uh, and these other books are found there between the New and Old Testament. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And you know what? I think it's gonna make better sense for you guys just to see what I'm reading. Um, that way I have to keep stopping and resharing my screen. Uh, so moving on to Arthur Kessler's 13th Tribe. Arthur Kessler's book, The 13th Tribe, is an important piece of literature. It tells us that his people, i.e. the Jewish people today, are directly linked to the Japhetic people. The reason for Kessler's book was to find out if he was a Jew by blood but his investigations proved otherwise, hence the title, The 13th Tribe. If you are not aware, uh, there are only 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. In the book, we are given an account that specifically tells us Kessler's people are from the lineage of Tagorma. So it says here, he traces their ancestry not to Shem, but to Noah's third son, Japheth, or more precisely, to Japheth's grandson, Tagorma, the ancestor of all the Turkish tribes, we have found in the family registers of our fathers. Joseph asserts boldly uh, that Tagorma had 10 sons, and the name of their offsprings uh, were as following, uh, Uger, uh, Dursu, Avars, Hans, Basili, uh, Tarinak, uh, Tarn, Tarniak, uh, the Khazars, uh, Zogora, Bulgar, Sabar. We are the sons of the Khazars, the seventh. Okay. So this is from Arthur Kessler's book, The 13th Tribe. Arthur Kessler's book, by the way, is a very difficult read. I have the book. It's 
but he does a phenomenal job of proving that the um, his the European Jews are not from the line of Shem, but rather from the line of Japheth. When we read scripture, we can find that Ashkenaz is one of the sons of Gomer. This is important because European Jews, excuse me, are referred to as Ashkenazi Jews. Genesis 10.3, the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rifath, and Tagorma. We can conclude two things from this. The first, is European, the first is European Jews are from two of Gomer's sons, Ashkenaz and Tagorma. And second, the reference to Tagorma is untrue. <laughs> I would be more inclined to go with the former, but from the proof we have, it is clear European Jews are from Noah's third son, Japheth. Kessler explains that his people originally had their own empire. It is called the Khazarian Empire. This was at a time the Catholic, the or, uh, origin of Christian denominations, fourth century and Islam faith, sixth century, were both already formed. All right, uh, this is going to be a difficult map to see. Uh, the Khazarians were between the Black Sea and the uh, 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 Caspian Sea. It's been renamed several times. And the Khazarians were in this general area here around the Caucasus Mountains. All right. This information proves that modern day European Jews are Jews by religion and not by bloodline. It is also important to note that this also means that they are not Semitic or Shemitic because they are not from the seed, because they're from the seed of Japheth and not Shem. This means the term anti-Semitic as it is applied to the European Jews is inaccurate. Just as Catholicism and Islam had taken inspiration from the Hebrew scriptures, the historic evidence shows us the same is true for Judaism, which is what European Jews practice. And let me add a caveat to the novel. Not right now. We'll talk about that more in detail later. All right, at 746. Um, Genesis 9, 27, may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. The above prophecy tells us that Japheth would dwell in Shem's land. And this, uh, and this was and is realized when the Greeks and Romans took over the land of Israel and, uh, and the state of Israel uh, established in 1948. All right. So in Genesis 9, uh, the prophecy was that Japheth was going to dwell in the tents of Shem, okay? Uh, Japheth and his descendants are Gentiles, right? And in uh, Luke 21 and Matthew 24, the Lord says very clearly that uh, there's going to be a time on the earth called the time of the times of the Gentiles, right? Paul repeats that in Romans chapter 10, where he says that, um, that God is using the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy, okay? So just so we're not confused, the Gentiles are occupying the land that is considered the tents of Shem today. The Gentiles are occupying Shemitic, Semitic territory. History tells us that Ashkenazi Jews established the state of Israel in 1948, even though they are Japhetic and not Semitic. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do for the remainder of the time, the rest of this article talks about the Japhetic nations, gives you some historical reference to who they were, what other nations came out of them. Okay. Uh, I will, I will put this and make this available on the, uh, on the, in the groups. Where I want to show you now is I want to dig a little deeper into the Japhetic nations uh, by way of other writings, um, historical writings to so stand by. Okay, so Lewis, while you're doing that, and so yeah. I can ask Pastor this too. So, and it's a question. Okay, so I'm just thinking in my brain, right? Right. Um, and you guys can tell me if I'm 
wrong or I'm off course on this. Okay, so teaching this out, and this is just how I'm feeling without knowing all of the information, right? Teaching this out, and let's say that it's in a public forum or whatever it may be, it goes beyond limitless church. We, to me, it's like literally shaking up the world. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hey, who you thought you were, that's not it. Yeah, and so my question is, I'm like, this is huge. So like when I'm, I'm just thinking in my brain, this is really, really big um, for not only us to know who we are, but then also um, people that have defined themselves um, as such and to right. prove and say, hey, no, you're, that's not you. Right. So I guess what is the, um, the vision or what is, um, do we know or are predicting what's going to come of it? Because like, if you say, hey, Tanika, if I say, hey, I'm a Jew, this is who I am. And then you come and bring evidence of saying, hey, guess what? You're not, you know, like you're erasing all of this history and everything that I've ever known. And I thought that I was. Right. So what, what does it look like when it's presented to the world? Or do we predict like absolute, like chaos and madness happening? So, so from a biblical place, just in terms of end days prophecy, some things, some things have to take place on the earth with respect to the Hebrew people. Okay. So okay. in, uh, in Daniel somewhere around, I think it's chapter seven, I may be wrong, but it's somewhere in Daniel. Um, Daniel said, well, we get the, the term, the Daniel fast. The scripture says that Daniel learned by books reading through the book of Jeremiah and the other prophets that the time of their captivity was over. It had been 70 years and their captivity is over. And so the, the 21 days it took for the angel to show up to give him some clarity on what he read uh, was that, okay, yes, from a, from a uh, calendar time, you're correct. We have approached the 70 years, but these 70 years are also prophetic. So it's going to be 70 weeks of years. And he gives them some, some, uh, some mile markers, if you will, to identify when those weeks occur. Okay. And then there is, there is a time of, of, of seven weeks. And so 62, seven and one weeks. That's the breakdown. 62 weeks was until Messiah, the Prince come, which he came. Uh, he should be cut off, but not for himself, but for his people. So uh, he was cut off on the cross. Scholars agree that the 62 weeks of Daniel's prophecy was when the Lord was crucified. Then you have the matter of seven weeks and then one week. A week is seven years. So you have seven times seven, 49, and one week of seven uh, or seven years, right? And so where scholars sort of... Uh, sort of uh, split is the time that's remaining, right? But my point is to your question, God's going to deal with Hebrews in the last days. And if you have wrongly identified who the Hebrews are, then you will wrongly interpret where you are in time. So it's very important to understand who Hebrews are so that you can understand where we are in prophecy. The Lord rebuked the Pharisees because they could discern the face of the sky but they could not discern the sign of the times. Our inability, I say our, people of color, their inability at large to discern the face, the discern the sign of the times has much to do with how times have been obscured. So you read further in Daniel, you read about the fourth, uh, the he goat, um, which represents the fourth kingdom. The fourth kingdom, scholars agree, was Rome. OK, and the and and the leader in Rome thought to it's the, it's the scripture says thought to change times. So Rome has done a marvelous job of covering up where we are in the time. Hmm. It's our responsibility to read the Bible for ourselves, to read these other historical references and understand where we are in time, because if we say that uh, that the. Um, the, 
people who occupy Israel are the Jew and they return to their land in 1948, well, that throws off some timing for other end days prophecy, right? But if mm -hmm. you realize that the Hebrews have not returned to the land, there's a prophecy of them returning to their land. So Hebrews, there's a prophecy, Jesus said this, Luke 21, Matthew 24, talking about a return of Hebrews to their land. Okay, but if you think they're already there, <laughs> then you're going to wrongly interpret prophecy. Yeah. Okay. It makes sense. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Great question. Any other questions? No, nope. makes sense. All right. So what you see on the screen is a document that I did not write. It was referenced in someone else's uh, writings. And I went and found the document at this website, and this website no longer exists today. If you happen across any information on a website, a YouTube video, please tell me. I will record, download, copy. I will get that information and save it offline and deliver it back to you. Uh, so all those video links are links to, I'm pointing to behind me, I have a server in that closet back there, but that's where you're going. You're going to, in here. You're not going out to the internet where that stuff can be deleted, okay? So if you find something that's of value, let me know and we'll, we'll download it and, and, and save it for us. So this document is called Gog and Magog and the Kingdom of the Khazars. It's a long document. I'm not going to read all of it. I just want to read to you some of the highlighted portions that I have here. Concerning, uh, concerning the Khazarians, uh, the people of Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog, sound familiar, right? They are the children of Japheth. They are Gentiles. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, concerning their, uh, their appearance, this peculiar and obscure race inhabiting the land of the Khazars uh, were described as blue-eyed and very fair complexion. Commonly, they had long reddish hair, but were reported as very large of stature and a fierce countenance. So let me give you a little bit about the Khazarians. The Khazarians lived during a time of the Byzantine uh, uh, period, and they stood between the, calif the caliphates or, the, uh, or Islam and the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Right. So they were a people group who sort of kept everybody at bay. They were between the two. All right. And so these were a people who did not have anything of their own. They did not have any um, any skills, no, no building skills. But what they did was they taxed both sides. So if you want to come through here, come use my land as a passage to escape whatever. Then you're going to pay us money. And so we see that these folks are bankers. They collect money. Uh, the banking reference has to do with the Rothschilds. So the Rothschilds own all the banks, by the way. Uh, anyway, we're going. We're going to prove out who these people are. Again, there are a race of people so violent in their dealings with their fellow men that they were feared and abhorred above all peoples in that region of the world. Their land was cold and wet. According to their complexions are white, their eyes blue, their hair flowing and predominantly reddish, their large bodies and their cold and their nature is cold. Their general aspect is wild. I'm just, these are somebody else's writings. Uh, the ninth century monk uh, Druther of Aquitanine and his commentary on Matthew 24, uh, in Expositu in Matthewam Evangelitizatem stated that the Gazari or Khazars dwelt in the lands of Gog and Magog. Accordingly to Benjamin H. Friedman, himself a Jew and apparent longtime associate and confident of presidents and statesmen in an address presented in 1961 at the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C., the Khazars were so belligerent and hostile they were eventually run out of Asia and scattered amongst the nations of Eastern Europe. Henrik von uh, Neustadt around 1300 wrote of them as the terrifying people of Gog and Magog. So my point by bringing this up is just to give further evidence of who Gog and Magog are. Gog and Magog are, are children of Japheth. Japheth is the father of the Gentiles. 
and the Khazarians or the Ashkenazi Jews are people who come out of Magog and Ashkenaz, the Gomer and, and Ashkenaz, okay? Uh, it's 7.58. Real quick, let me just, it's going to be, this is an easy read. It's, I think it's just 24 pages. This is an easy read for those of you who care, who care to read it. It gives you a historical account of why the Khazarians adopted Judaism. So in brief, uh, their kingdom was losing power. The caliphates were getting stronger and the Roman uh, and Rome and its religion was getting stronger. And they were trying to determine, hey, how can we become a superpower, right? And so they, this document will show you all this stuff, it references and all that. Uh, so they reached out to, uh, to, uh, to Christians and to uh, Islam, and they asked, hey, why should we be join you or join the other? Well, both of them said that they owe their identity, their religious identity to Jews, right? And so then he calls a rabbi in to talk with him. And the rabbi says, of course, all other religions get their religious identity from us. And so then this guy taught, this rabbi taught the Khazarian king, Bulan, to uh, how to become, how to become a Jew. Now, this story is very similar to the story that you hear about uh, a guy named, give me a second. Mm -mm. Uh, the, there's a Maccabean, there's a Maccabean priest in the book of Maccabees who did the same thing for uh, I cannot remember his name, but what they would do to bring peace to a, to a group of folks who were otherwise not part of, of, uh, of Jewish society, uh, Hebrew society, is they would make them become Jews, right? So all of the rights that Jews have to undergo uh, circumcision and all those sorts of things, they had to adopt that along with the along with their worship of God uh, as was part of their conversion. And so we see we, when you read this document, you will see how the, the Khazarians adopted Judaism as their religion because then they wouldn't be subject to Christians or to Islam. Khazarians are Jews because of their conversion. They are not Jews by blood, which is what Arthur Kessler was stating in his book, The 13th Tribe. So Jews who occupy Israel today are so-called because they are Jews by conversion and not by blood. Their origin is from is of uh, is from Khazar, which is uh, which is a son, a, a nation of of Ashkenaz, a Japhetic nation, which is why they call themselves Ashkenazim Jews. They call themselves Ashkenazim Jews uh, because that is exactly what they are. So can I ask you this just so that I understand? So yes. are the, peop the people from Shem and Ham, are they considered Jews? So that's a great question. So the term Jew, while it does appear in the Old Testament, it seems to, it seems to relate to the people of the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah and Benjamin, and excuse me, because majority Judah. And so they called them Jews for short. It's a reference to those folks who are of the southern kingdom of Israel. So the kingdom of Israel was split 
and it was so-called Israel was the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom was, was the kingdom of Judah, okay? And the northern kingdom was taken into captivity uh, to Assyria, okay? okay. The, the southern kingdom was taken into captivity into Babylon, but God did something with the southern kingdom that he did not do with the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom, after uh, Nebuch after Babylonian rule, came the Persians and the Medes. Well, the Persians, uh, they let the Jews go back to their land and rebuild, okay? Yeah. So in the order in Daniel chapter nine, it's either nine or, uh, it's either chapter seven or chapter nine, somewhere in there. So you have these four kingdoms that were these four kingdoms. So Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, this image, and Daniel interprets the dream in Daniel chapter two, and it gives them the interpretation of the dream and this image are four kingdoms, which the scripture says shall arise out of the earth. Okay. So the first kingdom was Babylon. The second kingdom was Persia media. The third kingdom was Greece and the fourth kingdom was Rome. Okay. And so um, the second kingdom that uh, had the people of God, the Hebrews in captivity, were the Persians. But Darius, or Darius of the Medes, he told them, and you can find this in the book of Ezra, you can find this in, um, so it's Ezra and Daniel, they were contemporaries. Uh, Nehemiah, I believe as well, but I'm not so sure about Nehemiah, they were all contemporaries, and, uh, and you will see uh, King Darius or Darius uh, letting the Jews go back to Israel to rebuild their land. Okay. That's why they're in their land when the Greeks and then subsequently the Romans occupied them. So they're already back in their land. So they were taken. And that's why we only see the Jews, that is the, North, the Southern kingdom, Judah, we only see them throughout the rest of the scripture because when the, uh, when the uh, Assyria, when it lost its power, legend has it that the, uh, the Northern Kingdom took, as we were talking about earlier, the Middle Passage to a place and it's 806. So don't let me take y'all's time. Y'all good for another 10, 15 minutes? So I'm good. I'm good because so I want to hear about the middle text. I want to add to that after after you could, uh, finish that statement. OK, so uh, I'm going to show you another document. Just give me half a second. Uh, so the uh, the southern kingdom, the excuse me, I'm sorry, the northern kingdom, which was originally taken to captivity by Assyria, when the Assyrian kingdom fell, they were free. <laughs> And they decided to take uh, the Middle Passage and go to uh, and go to uh, this place. Give me a second. Oh, let me. Uh, so they go to a place. Give me a half a second. Uh, let me find the name of this. OK. OK. The name of the place is called Arsareth. Mm, OK, Lewis. Yes. So. So let me jump in. I'm, I need to show everybody this. I need to show everybody this. You said Arsareth. Everybody has, are you on your phone? Are y'all on your phone or your computer? I'm on my computer. All right, because you need to be able to look at this. I'll, I'll, I'll read it, but you need to be able to look at it. Everybody Google um, the, the number two. It's second es Esdras, E-S-D-R-A-S. Yeah, second Esdras. I can pull that up. Second Esdras. E S D R A S. Now, second Esdras is um, first Esdras is considered to be an apocryphal book. The second Esdras is not considered necessarily to be an apocrypha, uh, a book of, of the apocrypha. Um, it's considered to be um, uh, like pseudo historical type type book. But so, if you look at second Esdras, go to go to uh, verse forty. And I'm going to read it. This going to this going to kind of support what Lewis is saying here. Okay, and and this is the type of stuff that a group of and a group of men decided needed to be taken out of the Bible. Okay, second, second Esther. 
Number two, Estras, E-S-D-R-A-S, second Estras, chapter 40. 40, got you. Or verse, give me a second. Um, I'll, uh, second Estras, 13 and 40, I'm sorry. Second Estras, 13 and 40? Chapter 13, verse 40. I'm with you, hold on. I can put this on the screen. Okay, good, good, good. Excellent. Lewis is going to put it on the screen. Excellent. Uh, east. Okay. So when you look, let me slide. Let me slide this little thing over. Man, my my own better. face is okay. All right. So when you look at it, it says those those are the ten tribes, which are which were carried away prisoners out of their own land. This is talking specifically about the Northern Kingdom. In the time of Osea, the king, whom Sal Manasseh, the, mm -hmm. the king of Assyria, led away captives, and he carried them over the waters. And so they came into another land. Okay? Jump down to verse number 45. For through that country, there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half to, to get there, okay, by ship. And the same region was called Arsered, okay? Now, I'm, I'm really going to mess you up with this. If you were to uh, look up Arsered in the Jewish Encyclopedia, so first of all, this is what Columbus read. Columbus, Columbus, even Columbus read Second Estrus, chapter 13, verse 40. Okay. When you get down to verse 45, okay, that a year and a half and the same region is called Arsereth. Why do I know Columbus read this? Because Columbus identified, and you can look this up in the Jewish Encyclopedia. Columbus identified the Americas as Arsereth. Wow. So when they said cross the water. So it was a year and a half voyage from the land of Asher, uh, which is north of Saudi Arabia, from the land of Asher, the Assyrians, a year and a half pass, a year and a half journey to get to a place called Aseroth. Wow. Yeah. And so uh, this is, I believe that I can prove that the Northern Kingdom, which came by way of the Middle Passage to Aseroth, the 10 tribes, the Northern Kingdom, they settled in, in the land that's now called Mexico, Central America, and South America. There were some on the North American continent and these, they, they, they were called Indians only because, <laughs> only because Columbus thought he was discovering India, right? Or at least that's the story that we've been told. This, this is big, <laughs> wow. Y'all, yeah. y'all, um, because when you look at it, when you look at the Native Americans, and I'm gonna shut up, Louis, I promise, shut up. All right. okay. When you look at, when you look at the Native Americans, a lot of their practices, a lot of their um, religious practices mirrored um, the that of of Israel. A lot of the a lot of what they observed, um, different moon feasts and so on and so forth, that as they would call them, it mirrored that of of, of Israel. Okay, so. Um, and that's a conversation for a different day, but um, the dots do connect. The, the thing is, they don't want us to know the dots connect, okay? And, and it's, it's one of the greatest deceptions. It is the greatest deception. Let me not say one of the greatest deceptions. It is the greatest deception uh, of all time, okay? When you have a people, um, I mean, not just Black people. Listen, very clearly. Yeah, I mean, because because 
Israelites were not were not the Negroes. We're not those. We're not. Hammered. I'm talking about Native Americans. I'm talking about people from South America and Mexico, because you need to understand that these regions were occupied by melanated people. Everybody wasn't, uh, as Lewis would say, blue black necessarily, but um, but these were these were melanated people, were. right? These regions were, were occupied by these people. And over time, what happened, just like here in the state of Texas, um, there was a time in the state of Texas to where Texas looked like uh, it was a different Texas, okay? It did, there, now I'm not talking about white Texas. I'm talking about it was Native American Texas, right? And then there was a time to where it was Mexican territory, Mexican Texas, right? And then you you fast forward in, in the timeline and Texas began to look like it was it was white. It was a red state, a Republican state, just right. And then over time. So give enough time in any geographical area. You give enough time for migration. You give enough time for um, j- just just life and the pigment of the people and the culture changes. Right. Those white people hear me very clearly. You've never heard me say it like this before. Certainly I haven't said it like this over the pulpit. Those white people are not the original uh, are not um, the original Hebrews. I I accept the fact that they are Jewish converts and I respect that. But those white people living in Africa are not the original Israelites. And unfortunately, many of them believe the lie that their grandparents told them right and and that's unfortunate and so and and tanika to answer your question this ain't about i'm not worried about backlash from the world i think i think what god is doing is there's a there's an awakening that's taking place right now this conversation is going on in, in lots of different places right now. There's an awakening that's taking place right now. There's people that are saying, you know what? That just doesn't seem right. Where did they come from? This, this just doesn't add up, right? And so as the awakening um, really takes flight, I think it's going to cause people to um, confront the possibility that I... I could possibly be a direct descendant of a special people. And I'm not saying everybody is. I'm not saying everybody is. But what I am saying is, it's not the people that um, the world has propped up as being um, some type of special people um, to occupy a special territory that was given to them by God. That's not their territory. All right. And I'm not, I'm not hating on Israel, but I'm simply saying the truth, the truth is the truth. Does that make sense? Everybody? Yes, it does. Uh, Just briefly in the last couple of minutes, I'll just show you this article. Uh, I got the article from this Michael Rurock blog he references the same Jewish encyclopedia that Pastor just mentioned. It says, the name of the land beyond the great river far away from the inhabitation of man in which the 10 tribes of Israel will dwell, observing the laws of Moses until the time of restoration. He references Ezra to Columbus identified America with this land. See this person's Christopher Columbus translated by Dr. C. Gross, page 15, Jewish encyclopedia articles. So this, this, is, this is not made up stuff. So uh, the nine tribes of the Moorish Empire that were here before the arrival of Christopher Columbus, uh, America was known as Asareth, Reuben, the Florida Black Seminole Indians, Gad, Chen, Su, Apache, Asher, Asher, Incas, uh, Colombia to Uruguay Indians, uh, Nephthalim or Naphtali, Argentina to Chilean Indians, Manasseh, Cuban, Simeon, don't know, Issachar, Aztec, Zebulun, Guatemala, Panama, Mayan, uh, Joseph, uh, Ephraim, Arawak, Tayano, uh, Boracua, Indians. 
Um, this is another relatively easy read, uh, and I won't read the whole thing. I think I may have mentioned earlier that the idea of racism began a long, long time ago because they needed they needed a way to differentiate Christians from non-Christians and uh, they use race as a motivator. But this document just goes through uh, uh, Jews were expelled from Spain under the, Inqu and the, the Inquisition. Anyway, there's a lot of good stuff in here about some historical things, uh, particularly about, about Jews. Uh, they used to be called, I've got uh, called Black Portuguese. So they, they used to live there. They were kicked out, moved over to St. Thomas, uh, uh, to the Virgin Islands. Um, anyway, I have all this stuff documented. I don't have time to go through it all right now. So we're at a place where I can continue the conversation next week about JPEF, or we can move on into Shem. But I think there's a lot of stuff to unpack about JPEF. And if you guys don't mind, I'd like to continue with JPEF next week. So we'll, we'll go over all this stuff that, that's, uh, that's on the screen right now. Um, this document demonstrates who the different peoples were who settled in those locations in, uh, in the middle Americas, okay? Louis, can you go over that just, one, just in 60 seconds? Can you go over that one more time? That that part about Columbus wrote in his own that's that's his writings, and and where and the names of those the different uh, Native American tri uh, um, tribes. Um, yes. yes, sir. Yes. So the nine tribes of the Moorish Empire that were here before the arrival of Christopher Columbus, written by Cristobal Colon in 1492. America was known as Araseth, Arsareth. Reuben were the Florida Black Seminole Indians, Gad, the Chen or Sioux Apache, Asher or Asher, the Incas, Colombia to Uruguay Indians, Naphtali, Argentina to Chile Indians, Manasseh, Cuban Indians, Simeon, we don't know, Issachar, Aztec Indians, uh, Zebulun, Guatemala to Panama, Mayan Indians, the Mohawks, and Joseph, Ephraim, Arawak, Tayano, Barakua Indians. Okay, this was found Hebrew University Tribes of Aboriginal Nations .com. So this, that was Hebrew University Tribes of, of, of Aboriginal Nations .com. So that's where this, this part came from. So the people who occupied the Middle Americas when uh, Columbus arrived. And let me just make something very clear. A lot of times we make the argument that Christopher Columbus did not discover America because how can you discover a place where the indigenous people are watching you arrive from the shore, right? Mm -hmm. You need to understand something. The term discovery is a legal term, okay? It's a legal term that was derived by the Roman Catholic Church that was given to the King of Spain to give him, and it was commonly called the doc, it was called the uh, law of nations or the doctrine of discovery. In other words, when you arrive at a place and that place is not occupied by people who look like you, then you have the authority to overtake that place and put the peoples of that place into perpetual slavery. That's called the law of nations. Uh, the United Nations still references the law of nations today. If you give me a second, I will show you a document uh, from the uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, from the UN. Bear with me. Hey, Lewis. Yes. While you're looking that up, I want to I want to play something. It's real quick. It's, it's 20 seconds. Go ahead. There was an old there's an old Western uh, made back in 1965 by the name of Cat Baloo. Um, Y'all listen to this scene from this old Western. You might be able to see this. I don't know if you can see it. Let me see. Uh, Pat Blue. Okay, listen to this I'll real stop. quick. 
film back in 1955. It got low. We can't hear it. Okay. Indigenous Americans from the lost tribes of Israel. Pastor, there's talking. We can't hear it. You can't hear that? No, pull it back from the microphone. Just hold it in the air. Okay, okay, okay. Lost tribe of Israel, but he won't admit it. Just ain't true. He was an ex-congressman of these United States, I tell you. Oh, but maybe he was mistaken. Oh, no, he was not. Jackson just got a mean, stubborn streak, and there is all. I brought Mr. Bernstein, the telegraph operator, out here from town last month. And he stood right where you're standing now, and he talked Hebrew at Jackson for 10 minutes by my watch, and Jackson pretended he didn't understand a word. Now, I call that stubborn. Check out this book. So, so in that movie from 1965, it's an old western from 1965. What's the movie called? It's <laughs> you liking that, aren't you, Lewis? I just need some information. It's an old Western. It's called Cat Baloo. It was okay, I'm gonna play. It, I'm gonna play it one more time. Called Cat Baloo, and it shows the actor John Marley, who played as the father, brings out the fact that the indigenous Americans were from the lost tribes of Israel. I'm so Indian. I'm not one of the chosen people. All right, go ahead, be stubborn if you want. I ain't stubborn. Oh, not much you ain't. You know, according to an ex-congressman of these United States, I heard give a lecture at the Jadopa this winter. Indians is a lost tribe in Israel, but he won't admit it. Just ain't true. He was an ex-congressman of these United States, I tell you. Oh, but maybe he was mistaken. Oh, no, he was not. Jackson just got a mean, stubborn streak, and there is all. I brought Mr. Bernstein, the telegraph operator, out here from town last month. And he stood right where you're standing now, and he talked Hebrew at Jackson for 10 minutes by my watch, and Jackson pretended he didn't understand a word. Now, I'm cold like stubborn. Check out this book, Engine. All right. <laughs> That's a good stuff. Listen, mm -hmm. the more information we can get, better, right? And so uh, there's no such thing as too much information, at least not in this area. This document you see on the screen is from the United St uh, Nations um, uh, from 2010. Uh, no, it's not from 2010. Yeah, February 2010. And this is an impact on indigenous people of international, right? So they're trying to understand the impact uh, computer studio on. They're trying to understand the impact of computer, thank you. Uh, understand the impact of and the rights of indigenous people. So when you go to a land and there are people that are already occupying that land, what rights do they have? It's funny, they should be having a discussion about the rights of indigenous people when you walk on their land and they're already there, what rights do they have? Well, in this document, they reference uh, the doctrine of discovering, right? So what is this whole doctrine of discovering? Well, you will find uh, do, 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 do. The global scope and history of the doctrine of discovery, what is now called international law, was previously known as the law of nations, reference number seven. I'll read this, it's tiny. In an earlier era, the law of nations was commonly used by international law commentators. The Tao provides an example. In cases of doubt arising what is the law of nations, it is now an admitted rule among all European nations that our common religion, Christianity, pointing out the principles of natural justice should be equally appealed to and observed by all as an unfailing rule of construction. In other words, their own rule was the law of nations, the doctrine of discovery. Uh, Wheaton wrote in 1845, during the Middle Ages, the Christian states of Europe began to unite and to acknowledge the obligation of an international law common to all who profess the same religious faith, all right? The origin of the law of nations in modern Europe may be thus traced to two principal sources, the church, canon law of the Roman civil law, uh, and, uh, and then this preliminary study uses the phrases such as the Christian states of Europe or Christian nations of Europe because they're in keeping with the actual terminology. So, the law of nations, international law has at its root, the Roman church. The Roman church gave uh, the Pope in 1414, I can't remember the year, 
I have it here somewhere. He wrote an edict to the king of Spain, giving him the authority to take over nations that were not Christian nations. He went to Africa and he did just that. He went to Spain, uh, Spain, he went to the Americas and he did the same thing. They came, they came and they put these folks under what's now called the law of nations. The United Nations still abides by what's called international law that began with papal bulls from the 13th century. All right, it's 8.30. And we will pick this up next week, continuing our conversation about JPEG. Okay, there's a lot to unpack with uh, with with that man and the uh, and all that has occurred in the earth. Pastor mentioned this. I'll echo it again. This is the single biggest uh, deception on the earth. Your third question, I believe, in your questionnaire was, is there a worldwide deception and are you part of it? Okay. The answer that we all should have come to is one, yes, there's a worldwide deception. And two, yes, we are all part of it because we have been kept in the dark about who we are. I didn't realize you were there, Pastor Don. Did y'all catch all that stuff that I showed about the, okay, the, the Northern Kingdom and their arrival into the Americas? You're probably muted. That's why I can't hear you. I, I just walked in. I had some things to do with Sailor, so I just walked in. I no worries. About eight o'clock. So yeah. No I'll, worries. I'll, I'll catch it. I'll catch it next time. Okay. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, I didn't begin the recording until about 35, 40 minutes after we had started. The great mm -hmm. news is that we're going to cover some of this in recap next week, and so we'll have that plus this here. Are you going to post those two, the first two articles in resources if we wanted to? Yes. Read? Yes. And okay. uh, I need to give you what I did from last week as well. The video is out there, but the article is not. And that, so might help I, us. that might help us so that I know you can't cover everything, but at least it'll give us more, um, help us engage more. Right. So um, today, summing up what we've gone over, we talked about the fact that there was a worldwide flood and eight people were saved. That is Noah, Mrs. Noah, Ham, Sham, and Japheth and their wives. Those are the eight souls that were saved after the flood. The scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 10, verses one through five, it talks about Japheth, which was the elder, the oldest son, and his lineage. The scripture says in Genesis 10, verse five, that Japheth is the father of the Gentiles. We look at a map uh, of Paul's missionary journeys. Paul said he was the apostle of the Gentiles, and we discovered that Paul spent his missionary trips in Europe. We further discovered that Shemites and Hamites are not technically called Gentiles. We learned that, uh, that we've been told that if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. That's just simply not true. Uh, Gentiles are only Japhetic nations, okay? We talked about the conversion of the European Jews from Khazar to, uh, uh, to Judaism. And we'll pick up and talk up some more about that next week. Any questions before we close in prayer? I know there's a lot of information to unpack. Uh, it's, um, I can just say it's emotional. That's what I would say. Can I help you with your emotions? I want to, I'm going to make it even more emotional right now. If you look at Revelations chapter 2, verse 9, and Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord says this to us. He says, uh, Behold, I will take those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not. Behold, I will take them and cause them to come and worship at your feet and to know that I have loved you. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. Because right now, this, you know, like, it's just, yeah. Yeah. Your your emotions go up and down as oh, you yeah. learn and as you read and as you study. So, yeah. Okay. I wrote those two scriptures down. Yeah. What was the, Revelation second, one? What was the second scripture? Revelation 2 9, Revelation 3 9. Mm -hmm. The Lord. And I have a question. I have a question. The 1611 um, Bible that the pastor has. Is there a um, um, a writer or version, King James version? Is there one that's recommended? So let me. So, so I don't know. So, so Pastor, your sixteen eleven. 
Are the F's, S's, I'm sorry, the S's, F's in your Bible? Say that one more time. So in 1611, the word these was spelled T-H-E-F-E. -E. Yeah, this is this is the original. Okay. So, yeah, so this Thompson, is the original. This is, is the Thompson anniversary. Nelson? Is that Thompson this Nelson? is the anniversary. This is the 400th anniversary edition. So this is written as it was written. Okay. All right. So it, oh, so that's an edition. If, yeah. Thompson I mean, Nelson so has one. if you use the software eSword, you can download the 1611 on your app if you use eSword. Uh, for those of you who use an Android phone, it's not called eSword in the Android store. I think it's called My Sword in the Android store. Okay. But for those of you who use an iPhone, it's called eSword, E-Sword. You can download a bunch of different Bible versions. The 1611 is one of them to include the Apocrypha. Um, and um, it used to be free. I think it's still free for a PC, but it's not free for, uh, for iOS. Okay. The Thank man, uh, he's, anyway, anyway, anyway. Any other questions? You are not who the world has told you you were. Uh, it's interesting, Peter, I'll close with this here and my just, uh, Peter, let me make sure I don't lie. Uh, Peter is written to a specific group of people. It says, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All right. Those strangers are Hebrews. Uh, that was 1 Peter 1, 1. I think 2 Peter 1, 1. Okay, it doesn't say the same. But when he talks about those strangers, so the book of Peter is written to Hebrews, and he says some very specific things to them about them, uh, about who they are, royal priesthood, holy nation. Yes, it's written largely to the church, but specifically that epistle was written to Hebrews that were scattered abroad. Okay. You make you look at your Bible a little different too. James is the same way. James was written it's for the church, but it was written to Hebrews. Obviously Hebrews were written to Hebrews. And so a lot of the writings, uh, some of the writings in the, in the New Testament are written to Hebrews specifically. Peter, James, Hebrews uh, uh, are just of the three that were. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble. And like I said, I'll post this stuff up here. I won't move until I post it. Because if I move, then I'll get distracted. Pastor Stacy, will you close us in prayer? Yes, sir. God, we thank you.